Hi, my name is Nathaniel Jones. I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar, AirNet, using 3D convolutional neural networks to estimate annual radiation intensities on building facades by Ellie Jungmin Han. This webinar is hosted by the IBIPSA USA Research Committee with the goal to share new ideas from research to the building simulation community. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them in the chat window. At the end of the 40 minute presentation, I will unmute our audience on Zoom for a discussion with Ellie. Next slide, please, Ellie. AIA Continuing Education credit is available for attending this webinar. Please email info at aiaeb.org with your AIA membership number to receive credit for attending today's event. And now I'd like to introduce Ellie Jungmin Han. Go ahead, Ellie. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning and good afternoon or good evening, depending on wherever you're in the world. My name is Ellie Jungmin Han. I'm a doctor student at the Harvard GSD and a research assistant at the Harvard Center for Green Buildings and Cities. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, one of my paper pub published in the IBIPSA last year, and this time I'll more focus on the general idea and of the deep learning based project overall and the related skills and knowledge you need to know before start your own BPS project using deep learning, building performance simulation project using deep learning. So before uh, diving into the today's research topic, I wanted to share briefly my journey as a designer, consultant, as well as a software developer. I first started off my career as a designer and consultant where I noticed the gap in collaboration between the two. So after experiencing this firsthand, um, I set a goal to bridge this gap by shifting design decision-making process to the earlier stages. My initial efforts, efforts began at the CMU by developing my first BPS software to estimate the P potential and cost analysis with green roofs using Grasshopper and Rhino interface. At the time, I was use, using the roof areas of the, all the CMU campus buildings and created tools that allow us to make only the uh, stage of design decision making. Then right at the GSD, uh, my focus was to implement physics-based solar algorithm to develop a user-friendly interface for designers and also investigating the use of empirical formulas for the storm model runoff properties for design. However, uh, I realized that the, both this method has their own limitations in terms of speed and uh, accuracy, and it's quite difficult to generalize so far. So now my uh, research focuses on the data-driven modeling for the performance-driven design and the early design support tool development. So uh, uh, starting from, uh, from uh, some of the reference I wanna give you to and share today. So some of you might be familiar with uh, this Philip Sisola study in 2017, who is my computer vision professor at MIT, but like uh, why I'm showing this to you today well, um, actually, this was the first deep learning paper I read because of like the, this fascinating uh, image of the generated image of the facade that we can see on, the, on this slide, actually. This image to the image translation technique inspired me as a designer to explore more diverse design space for the facade design and engineering. By labeling architectural elements while training a, a convolutional neural network, pix 2 pix could generate the novel design options utilizing deep, deep neural networks. Uh, okay, this is the second uh, project I want to share today. Uh, now, uh, doesn't it look just cool? This is the actual a, a amazing plan generator that uses the also deep neural network developed by uh, Chalu called Archigan. I'm not going to talk about like the, this specific paper, but I just wanted to edit this to here to emphasize that after seeing those two really awesome and cool project utilize deep learning, I just thought up to my myself, uh, why can I use deep learning algorithm into our performance driven design and the simulation project? So the obvious next step for me was to uh, take a look at the neural network, deep learning neural network to try and try and understand them more. This is the, one of the first images that I found uh, when I'm looking up the neural networks. And for some reasons, uh, I felt that I looked oddly familiar uh, in this uh, network in terms of my expert area of exper expertise. Can anyone see why? 
next slide will be the answer for me. So because of the complexities. So that I noted when I'm seeing the neural network look very similar to the complexities that I seen uh, when I'm looking at the building information models. Basically layers upon layers of information or uh, uh, in, in uh, computer science world that call the hidden layers or neural network is similar to the, what, what we are like actually dealing with our models in everyday day, daily life. So I found this picture amazing because it really paints, uh, paints the story of how engineers and architects are experts in their relative domain and historically committed, committed a tremendous effort in trying to know all about these many layers and untangled in that details. Especially uh, with the physics-based model approaches we, we, we took uh, over the few decades. However, now the par paradigm has shifted with the use of data-driven models and the available data sets. Will we leave the tangled and uncertainties in this life with the building structure and the com components? Uh, as they are and focus the data what we have, I wanna, yeah, I wanna talk about. Uh, so which brings me to focus of my presentation for today about that background. Uh, I wanna share with you the RENet, which is the network that I use to predict the annual uh, radiation intensities on the building facade. Uh, with this uh, RENet, the main objective was to introduce the deep learning method uh, to act as a building's physical properties while stripping away the physics-based world and its limitation in somehow. So this project will demonstrate the potential integrating deep learning as a powerful tool for building performance simulation and its modeling. So just a moment ago, like uh, I emphasized the importance of the only design decision making as a software developer and an engineer as a, and the, as a former architect. So now, now I want to talk about the importance of the developing only design support tool for BPS briefly. So the rationale for developing support, uh, design support tool earlier on stems from the notion of collaborative working environment, or environment for designers and consultants. But uh, isn't it uh, isn't an uh, easy task for me? And uh, is there are many issues that we need to ad uh, address during the design decision making process? such as environmental issues, energy-related metrics, envelope design, occupant health, and so on, just to name a few. So we can tackle some of those uh, previously mentioned issues through the architectural design process as our architect. But it's not solely enough. Like we also need some support from sustainable consulting for environmental and performance-driven design to advance our solution. So as I've said many times, both design and consultants need to be, need to be collaborative. Uh, so as you could uh, guess, both process should be working parallel in any form of collaboration. Here we can uh, see a side by side of the two different timeline for the time cost exchange in the architectural design process and modeling process. The graph to the left shows the peak or the highest effort put into the modeling in the construction and documentation phase of the timeline. But while the graph of the light uh, on the right uh, shows the peak of the schematic design phase, if we compare this to different uh, in, in terms of the image, you can see that the cost of design changes significantly, significantly lower when shifting this effort into the earlier stages of the design of the process. On top of the gap in the collaboration between the consultant and architects, there is a minimal interoperability between the software and program that are, that are used by each of the expertise, which only hinders any collaborative potential. And also there is a big difference in the complexities between those two tools like used by its field of expertise. However, there have, been, there have been like some great effort to connect those like two fields of expertise by having the one flexible and integrated BPS platform. Despite, despite those efforts, like there is still a limited number of tools available like compared to the engineering and the design software. And even though the interface has been simplified and then still used the external engine, but still it used the external engine of the software from one to the other field such as some of those like uh, software using, still using the Energy Plus as backend engine as their back um, uh, for their uh, interface. 
So although this is a great step in the right direction, but still allow uh, some communication between consultants and architects, there is still much room for improvement, I believe. So one of the alternative to a physics-based model is for me, is the data-driven models. These models are quite fascinating since it has more potential to be used in the earlier stages of the performance-driven design. There are two different models we can be used in the building performance simulation. And as you may have guessed, one is the model historically well validated and used the physics-based model. And the other one is the newer data neural model, which is the data-driven model, which has been used uh, in the field of engineering for the past decades. And then uh, both are like pretty much well researched and they keep validated. Physics-based model used the first principle physics rules as a primary engine to explain our world and environmental condition around, the, around and within the buildings. However, this uh, model requires making many assumptions while yielding uncertainties in modeling the buildings. In contrast, data-driven model utilize data from different sources and yield the most suitable model with higher functional approximation. For the last several decades, physics-based models have been widely used to evaluate the performance of the buildings. However, replacing this type of buildings with a data-driven model is a new trend now. So what I, what I keep saying, the data-driven model, this model is the various model uh, type that can be utilized uh, any subset of the artificial intelligence. We can see here uh, the machine learning is the largest subset of the artificial intelligence. And within the subset, uh, we have the artificial neural networks or ANS. And within ANS, we have the learning method and its relevant different components and the models and architecture. I believe many people believe that the deep learning will be the hottest research topic for the building performance simulation and other engineering areas and uh, in the in, in current situation. This is because deep learning allows for fewer inputs with less computation time, while still offering superior performance and the potential for data augmentation and keep um, uh, evol evolving the model itself. In particular, deep learning has received significant of, of attention for use in predicting solar radiation and airflow air patterns on the round structure uh, of the building. Also, this type of uh, method can provide the immediate uh, innovative design solutions, which allows designers to obtain instantaneous feedback regarding the effect of the proposed design while they modify their building's design. So, before we diving deep into the deep learning, uh, I want to briefly go over like the, the linear modeling. There are many ways to generate a relatively accurate appro functional approximation while also minimize BPS simulation time. Among these, a linear regression is the most popular and widely used method, as we all know. So linear modeling is the prediction using weight factors of the, each features, but how well does this equation predict the true value called y? To achieve a prediction as a close to the uh, possible to true value y, or uh, we must uh, define the loss function L and choose the appropriate weight to minimize loss across the data points. As you, uh, as you can see by the equation on the screen. Unlike linear modeling, deep learning could uh, solve more complex tasks due to the number of hidden layers present, like you see in this diagram. And ANM models are a class of machine learning. As I previously shown, this is the able to determine the best weighted features through the hierarchical process and modeling iterative, iterative process. The neural network can identify the best set of weights that can produce the desired output as they iterate over the data. And neural network perform well when predicting the nonlinearity by implementing activation functions with multiple hidden layers. Because of this well-structured neural networks, this can be trained to capture the complexities of the various physical phenomena and environment around buildings and within, in, within buildings. Convolutional neural network, this is another representative of deep learning. 
uh, this been uh, recently used for the 3D representation of the building geometry. Due to the availability to boost large 3D DS data set and computational power, it is, it is possible to apply deep learning to understand specific tasks related to 3D data, such as segment image segmentation, recognition, pattern recognition, and cross blindness 3D CNN, uh, this has demonstrated superior performance in the 3D object classification and uh, detection too. This can also be used to distinguish the de uh, defective feature from geometric data to a high level of accuracy. So how does this all tie back to the building performance simulation? So that's that's all, that, that's my question. And then this is the important to know if I'll move to the next uh, slide. So let's, let us talk about like some of the benefit of using data-driven models and deep learning method in performance-driven uh, design. The first advantage we would be uh, would be the black box model type, which are deep learning models and multi with per, uh, multiple hidden layers, which does not require many assumptions uh, as an input. Secondly, the advancement in computer hardware technologies and GPU have allowed us to train in a model efficiently and reduce the amount of calculation time. Also, AN models can be easily integrated in any different type of CAD software uh, or designer use and other application options in engineering use. And therefore, the user interface can be simplified and become more intuitive. ANNs uh, and deep learning can rap rapidly provide the innovative design solutions, enabling designers to receive uh, instantaneous feedback on the effect of the proposed design change. So the benefits uh, of this uh, type of model and building design and performance-driven design include the reproduct reproducibility, time efficiency, and the scalability. Now, uh, what if uh, what if it was possible to combine the successful element of the two models we just talked about, which is the physics-based and data-driven model? That is why I call this uh, physics-guided data-driven models in this slide. Why would we try to put those like the model together? Like, let's review the figure that I showed in the relationship between the domain knowledge and the use of data to answer this question. So based on what we discussed about the physics-based model, we all know like that model require fewer data, but a higher degree of knowledge and expertise and, the, and assumptions. This is the part where uh, we as modelers are mostly involved. But we also went over how data-driven models follow the opposite trend from the physics-based model. Well, the knowledge domain or the assumption remained low, with higher use of data samples to train neural network for strong uh, prediction. As a building performance simulation consultant and expert, uh, how can we contribute uh, our domain knowledge while constructing AEM based like BPS models? By combining both of these models, we can see the physics guided data driven models in the upper right quadrant of the uh, graph. This combination enhances the model accuracy of the data-driven models by taking the full advantages of the accumulated data and then the amount of the data. And that with the, such as uh, the empirical equations, the experimental outcomes, and the first principle physics rules as a support. While still being able to use this large, uh, we, but what in this uh, benefit is like still we, build, we are able to use the large data samples available. More specifically, uh, by using the domain knowledge in the data-driven models, we could increase accuracy uh, with the use of physics in loss function and using the simulated data we could create uh, to train the model and also pro propagating extra data points using physics rules and allowing for calibration of the model parameters also available. So I strongly believe that uh, this is the area of research we as a modeler and the consultant and the software, uh, not, not just, for, as, just as a software engineer, can actively participate to construct the most suitable deep learning based BPS model and tools for designers use. So uh, yeah, all of this is very great. 
but what we, but my, uh, but like one last thing we should know that buildings are not two dimensional. So since we are uh, dealing with the three dimensional world and living in the three dimensional world, we are working with the three dimensional data type and, and in terms of the building and geometry and modeling. So we already discussed about how popular deep learning has become, but let's shift this focus to the possibility of uh, possibility of applying deep learning to 3D data really test, which is like uh, our most interest in Lysen. So like all things 3D, so 3D data can have unique structures and to make things more even complex, uh, their geometry properties can vary with the uh, different deep learning methods and modeling techniques. But 3D data can be classified uh, in this slide. Uh, you can see the 3D uh, data can be classified into the two different uh, domain. First one is the Euclidean domain, and the second one is non-Euclidean domain. So 3D Euclidean domain uh, data can be simplified as a grid-like structure. While 3D non-Euclidean uh, data does not have the grid-like grid array form, but it may help to you know, view the 3D Euclidean properties as an extension of the 2D and the 3D non-Euclidean data as a, you know, uh, the point cloud shape we, we are previously explored as a GIS data. So which would be more like suitable for regularly populated data such as book cell data. For example, uh, I'm going to color it shortly. So, and back to the BPF performance simulation. Well, as the, there are the different tasks, uh, the question becomes like, what would be the best DL rep deep learning representation of the building for the different BPS tags, such as energy, solar radiation, and airflow. For the energy simulation, each drone represents the space condition as a single singular point. So since energy simulation assume that the air and temperature are evenly distributed in the drones, each component like and points become an input for the energy in the ANM modules. And quantitative cal calculation for the available amount of daylight and solar exposure, uh, grid-like data points and array are populated uh, from the target surface as widely used. Lastly, the simulation for the uh, indoor air distribution or outdoor air distribution, we need to consider the point uh, cloud array type, which can be extracted from the mesh-like structure. So this is another, like, based on just literature review and the search uh, I found, I propose a relevant method to represent the 3D data for BPS task for modeling efficiency in uh, build, constructing the deep learning model. So we can see uh, four of the methods I propose here. First is like the descriptor, and the second one is voxel or the point cloud type, and then third one is the mesh and graph type, and the last one is another one with the voxel and oak tree type which always to compute the data and which are uh, for training the neural network. So for energy, the point per drone type, we can compute the data using the descriptor type and, or method. For daylight and solar radiation, we can use the voxelized type or the oak tree method to finally, uh, yeah, to simulate our uh, properties and values. And finally, for airflow, mesh type geometry and the graph-like structure, and as well as the voxel uh, representation can be used. So I provided you with uh, all this background in order to get this like details of the RNet today. So, so RNet is a physics-guided data-driven model utilizing the deep learning algorithm and specifically uh, 3D CNNs. And uh, I utilize the voxelated metrics as an input for this uh, of the 3D CNN to construct this uh, whole workflow and the process. So RENet was the building uh, built uh, was built using a physics-based radiance engine as a data generator and utilizes voxel structure for data-driven modeling and training. This is the RNS workflow. This workflow consists of three different parts. The data generation part, data pre-processing, and 3D CNN modeling and validation. So conventional modeling and simulation software tool were used in like all this, uh, all this step. So 
Rhino, Rhino and Grasshopper for parametric uh, modeling uh, or set it and or set and then uh, Diva and Grasshopper for radiation simulation for uh, set and Python three packets such as NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib we use for the data processing and visualization and TensorFlow and Keras for uh, the for use uh, for the modeling and validation. So firstly, to collect data sets, I defined the constraints and varied geometric options to export annual radiation intensity on the building's facade. The total 2000 over the 2044 data points were collected, including the height variation for the multiple target buildings and volume variation for the single building. The different location of the five uh, boundary buildings were fixed in order to simulate the uh, impact of the target building with the surrounding condition. The annual radiation value mapped on the facade were exported as a 3D point coordinate and equivalent values. To create input for the neural network, I matched the different coordinate and values for, from the simulated data to the 3D voxel representation. As this were neglected in this case study during the process, and I padded the metrics with categorical value from the 0 to 2. So I used 1 for a building and zero for the representing air and the two representing the building's boundary condition. And the output metrics follow the same structure of the input and padded with the normalized, normalized radiation value for training. This RNet takes like a 64 cubic grid with a voxel representation and numerical information such as longitude and latitude and global radiation was added. Uh, in this uh, specific paper, I used the I used the Boston weather, but like but like the reason I put this uh, information as the separate array as an input is like we have potential to augment our data sets to you know enhance the performance of our model by simple by changing the longitude and latitude information with the global radiation. So Arinet assumed the uh, you know, world to be the voxel in which both the target and boundary building exists. So based on this assumption, superimposed binary output metrics for all the buildings in the world were produced as a part of the data processing. This is the uh, RNS architecture. So VoxNet, a 3D CNN for real-time object recognition was referenced for this baseline architecture when uh, we are building arch uh, RNS architecture. So in here, the later latent variables containing the hidden information from the input were obtained using uh, when it passed through the arena. By having these latent variables as a uh, part of the training model, we were able to use the autoencoder architecture to map, the, map this variable back to the 3D space. So in order to increase the range of the captured information, such as the shadow and then the impact of the surrounding and the location of the sun, so we use more layers in the RNet compared to the VoxNet. This is the, also the merit of like the, using the deep learning, like we can keep add layers like by adding the complexity. So the proposed RNet consists of like two uh, 3D uh, convolution layers before the max plane layers and an architecture we drive the networks by passing two additional deconvolution layers when we, when we predict the value. So basically, these 3D image models were mapped onto the latent space once, then later reshaped by calculating the difference in radi radiation after passing this into the loss function that I just met, what I previously mentioned within the proposed 3D architecture. So to calculate uh, the error, we selected the mean scale error as a loss function. Uh, in addition, the model are only concerned with the radiation intensity on the building surface. So we customized it. So does the loss function was modified to only account for the MSD on the surface and then exclude those on the inside and outside of the building. We only computed the errors at the building surface and boundary conditions while ignoring all the airspace and the voxelated structure. Furthermore, we rejected the negative values and the set maximum uh, values for the radiation exposure annually this customized loss function like is, is can be achieved because like we have the base, basic knowledge of the 3D modeling and the architectural properties as well as the radiation information and knowledge on the physics. So the process on the left is an actual step we need to take to convert the cat type geometry into the voxel structure. 
So as you can see here, we have our buildings and boundary condition, and we combine those building in CAD software and then create our voxel word. And replacing this, uh, our CAD software to the voxelized uh, grid, as well as the boundary condition. So this table on the right shows the right uh, the size of the voxel grid and can distort the perception of the original distort, uh, geometry and further affect the effect of prediction result. So as you can see here, like 16 cubic voxel like, uh, pretty much distort our original geometry in somehow compared to the baseline model from the CAD. But like 16, uh, 64 cubic and, uh, and even more uh, maintain our original geometry and its, its properties pretty well. So when increasing the size of the book cells, the time of computation actually tremendously increased. This is the three-dimensional array. Therefore, we tested the accuracy and the training time while uh, different book cell size using RNA. The result of the computation time for each iteration in second with validation error is shown in the table here, you can see. So we can see the iteration time is exponentially proportional to the book cell as input uh, matrix yet maintaining similar error between like the 64 cubic and then 128 cubic uh, voxel grid. Therefore, we propose the 64 cubic voxel matrix uh, is su sufficient for data-driven solar radiation model in this, in this case. So you can see the simulated values on the top of the image and predicted uh, values on the validation set in the middle. The MSE, MSE adder are presented on the bottom, except for the edge areas. This is the result on the validation building too. We also apply this model to predict multiple building in validation building three. So uh, this to determine the capacity of predicting cell shade areas between these buildings. The error plot on the bottom of the figure indicate the RNET demonstrated the significant predictability for each building's facade and self shaded areas. However, this wasn't the case for the edges areas, like so we need to reconsider. So next I want to share with you like three test cases there are uh, their research from Larina. This geometry are completely different from the training and validation sets. After providing these uh, three options for test sets, we all also modify the testing simulation by you know having boundaries or without any boundaries. On the left, which is the simple building with a large horizontal oval hang in the middle, a round shape building, and the right, a large building with a light, light, large internal light core, center on the right. So, so the bottom figure represents six options that we are tested for predicting the radiation uh, received on the, on the test building. So Arena was uh, fully trained using this uh, geometry specifically box shape, but not for the shadings and overhangs and the internal light core. So the test building three showed the RNA can predict the shadows on the shading device. Test building four demonstrated RNA capac uh, capabilities for predicting trend, uh, transient surface, such as round corners, and RNA was never trained to be have predicted capacity for those attributes. So this is uh, our founding. However, the case of the test building seven, uh, we discovered the difficulties of the predicting the radiation intensities in the hollow areas of the building with the internal uh, light core, because we did not define the gen uh, geometric properties of the hollow area within these buildings. And, you know, radiance normally calculate this with the, uh, you know, weight tracing method and so on, but we haven't really trained the model with that. But still there's capacity like to evolve this model uh, when we figure this uh, out, uh, we figured out problem and issues. So the error plot figures that de demonstrate the result of the, all the tested buildings with and without boundary. And however, the absence of the boundary at the error rate is a little bit higher that, uh, at the 0 0.065 compared to the width, uh, geometry width boundary error at 0 0.04. So um, after uh, this um, paper and then test uh, with the uh, RNET in the, in the test set, uh, we decided to, actually I decided to advance this RNET 
because like, like I mentioned, like the ANN has the potential of data augmentation capacity and then reproducibility, and then as well as the potential of uh, uh, de de uh, photo develop uh, capacity and possibility. So now that we have discussed the potential data augmentation and fine tuning method, uh, model advanced uh, method for advancing our RNN. So I'd like to quickly just play, uh, present my most recent development toward the advanced RNN, which is called BoxNet. So advanced radiation uh, architecture of the cool box, which referred the, I told you the RNS architecture initially, but has substituted the deconvolution layer to the upsampling layer in order to maintain the dimensionality of the given infometrics. But when I'm training a uh, cool box, I also increase the total data set to the 2044 to the 8055 with more variation of the geometries and surrounding options. So the table at the bottom shows the errors on the training and validation sets for both RNET and Coolbox, as well as the ensemble model, which is the ensemble model is the weighted average of the Coolbox 1 and 2. The middle uh, uh, far right figure demonstrated the ensemble method to output from the Coolbox in a little bit, the predicting the solar intensity on the test data set on the hollow hollow like uh, light core. So, however, we can see in the cool box one, uh, uh, definitely it outperformed that the RNS since we increase the data set, we increase the option for the boundary buildings, and which uh, indicate that there's a huge potential to develop our data driven model further in, in the future uh, with even higher accuracy. So, I want to share uh, the findings from the RNS and cool box development to provide you with the guidance on developing your own data driven model for radiation utilizing deep learning method. So first, 3D CNN have a potential to learn the orientation and boundary condition of the different buildings. An ensemble and fine tuning method have a great promise in advanced your ANN model. So your ANN model is not firstly developed and done and moved to the next model. It can keep it you know, advanced and evolving. As cool books I just uh, showed, you, showed you the last uh, slide. And also, like when you model the ANNs, like the edge information should not be neglected when designing input for the CNN. And also, I encourage you to the, you know, uh, find the most suitable padding, uh, padding method for your information of the buildings, air, and surroundings. And lastly, for radiation simulation, I recommended at least like 32 to 64 cubic voxel to accurately predict the result. So that was like all my presentation. And then unfortunately, uh, with the recent provocation of the component uh, in the grasshopper and rhino ca called hopes, I was able to prepare a short demo using Arena. So I, lastly, I'm gonna share this with you and then um, and then I'm going to finish this presentation. So like what I just mentioned, the workflow of this Arena consists of the using hopes component residing in the rhino and grasshopper as a modeling software. And because of the, this component enabled us to utilize a pre-training TensorFlow model in the FLOSS environment. So I, I, this uh, makes us, make me able to prepare this short demo. As I mentioned in the introduction, we finally achieved a very simplified intuitive user interface with only two components. First one is Voxelizer and the second one is RNA. This is the screenshot of the code I inserted pre-training the TensorFlow model into the FLOSC environment. And yeah, I'm going to quickly show you this demo. So I simply implemented our most recent model for the radiation prediction and shows you the integrated workflow in Rhino and Grasshopper. So main function actually takes this uh, voxelized matrix of the building as an input and its surrounding as an input. And, it car in that, and then it calculates the radiation intensity on the building facade by connecting this to the pre-trained trained ANN model in the Flask, Flask web server. So this demo shows you the, actually the potential applicability of ANNs in CAP software and its usability with instantaneous like visual feedback and also simplified user interface. Since this demo is pretty short, um, yeah, we could like keep uh, changing our geometry while keep uh, checking this visualized wizard. 
So for the conclusion, this research actually provided the feasibility of achieving a physics-guided data-driven model, like I mentioned, so which can provide the instant feedback during early stages of the design. And uh, as you have witnessed this, uh, from the demo, the simplified user interface can be achieved while, uh, with the data-driven models and deep learning method. Therefore, I believe this RNN research could be unique and prominent opportunity for applied AI in the performance-driven building design and software development. So thank you very much for your attention today. And uh, I'm going to uh, just answering any questions you might have today. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Shelley. That was a very interesting presentation. It's really fascinating to see the work that you're doing. I want to remind everyone uh, that AIA Continuing Education Credit is available for attending today's webinar. Please email info at aiaeb.org uh, with your AIA membership number to receive that credit. Um, I wanna give everybody a moment to come up with questions and type their questions into the chat, either on Zoom or on YouTube. And uh, while you're typing in your own questions, I wanna start out by asking uh, one of my own. Um, Ellie, I, I'm curious about the number of uh, training uh, models that you had to teach uh, RENet with. So, you know, both in terms of the buildings that you were putting in and the surrounding geometric context. Um, and I wonder, you know, given that you said uh, that in some cases RENet was able to uh, demonstrate behavior that it hadn't been taught, like uh, providing shading on a round building, um, is there any danger of overfitting um, or, or do you have some way of checking for overfitting? Oh yes, the, uh, yes, that's a good question. Actually, yeah, that's what I that's what I like uh, told you about like the needs for like the developing advancing our uh, deep learning model for, um, you know, using the ensemble model or fine tuning method. Like so, first thing I uh, also came up my mind is what's the optimal data set for training. So I try to, you know, generate as much as data possible at the times, but it was the term project for me. So that was like limited time to train this model. So I, we set this uh, variation of the surrounding buildings and the variation of the heights of the different buildings as a number of buildings as we, as much as we can. And also on top of that, like the, uh, Oh, I didn't include in the slide. Uh, this is not a like absolute uh, method, but like part of the uh, method we could prevent overfitting. We actually uh, randomized all the data set, uh, sets we collected, and then like also sample that uh, uh, sample that the data from the from the uh, total data set. We don't really we didn't really use the whole the whole data set, but we incrementally uh, increase our data set and keep adding this. Uh, uh, train uh, to the original uh, original model. So we keep checking that uh, and also uh, after expanding this like to the test set, which is which is totally which are the totally different geometry. Uh, the interesting finding that is the R in that actually uh, captured the uh, like the orientation orientation and then uh, effect from the boundary buildings, even though we varied the uh, geometry uh, um, even though we vary the geometry uh, shapes and the numbers. So this, the, the, the potential limit, uh, the, the current limitation we face that can be reserved like by increasing more number of data sets and then more options at the same time, we fine tune our model itself. But yeah, there, there was like some of, some way we could uh, deal with it. And then the, the, I think it is important to that we found that like at least this 3D uh, structure was, um, uh, 3D CNN structure was optimized to predict our, represent our 3D word and radiation simulation. Right. Um, here's a question. Um, sure. A lot of uh, you know, the tools are out there. I think um, Keras might be an example are sort of built around image manipulation and, and two-dimensional uh, input arrays. Um, and you are working with voxelized data uh, so do you have to do anything different in order to, uh, in order to bring in that voxelized data and, and turn a CNN on it? Do you mean like the comparison between the 2D data to the 3D? Um, I, I think it's about uh, how do you, um, 
how do you input uh, 3D data into a tool that um, was designed for 2D data? Oh, I see. Um, so this, uh, actually I customized the books. I, I created two different functions for this uh, interface. The first one is Books Elijah, and that's the second one is the RNet itself. The Books Elijah, Elijah actually takes the BRAP information, which can be represented uh, as an array of the, uh, as a list, uh, list type of geometry with the, uh, with the multiple coordination and then it's, it's rules. So also the mesh can be also stored as a list and, and an array, but the, this books Elijah actually interpret and then reconstruct this uh, BRAP information or mesh information from the CAD modeling and then recreate this books related structure. So I use the, some of the ray, uh, ray casting method in the computer graphics and also, also like interpolate, uh, interpolation to recreate this books related uh, meshes uh, in, in, in this component. And um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, and then, and then on top of this, uh, and also, and then like the starting eye looking at the 3D books uh, data structure for our 3D work was based off of like train this with the 2D, uh, you know, with the uh, machine learning existing algorithms such as the random first regressor and so on, which has more like overfitting tendency I based actually previously. So I just like migrate this form of the to the book so to limit to expand our you know capacity to predict the more accurate result uh, avoiding overfitting. Okay, thanks. We have a question coming from Mohammed. Mohammed, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? So uh, first of all, thank you for your outstanding presentation and your work. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, seeing all this presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts of if, uh, if this approach would be feasible for using indoor radiation estimation, indoor, of indoor spaces like buildings, uh, it would be much more complex. Yeah, uh, yeah of course. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about your thoughts. Oh, definitely it, it is visible and it will be my, you know, uh, next component, like the publication of the next step. So actually I was working on that already. So the process is pretty much the same. And then the way we took the, the generate the uh, simulation data and the training it, that process is pretty much the same. But the only difference from the indoor and outdoor radiation is I take into the consideration of the location of the window and the size of the window and the relationship between the window and the, and the grid points internal in, in, the, in the internal space. So for that one, I, I hopefully I'll just present in the next uh, webinar, like and after I published it. But like I can tell you, like we can we could consider the location and then the relation between the voxel grid point internal in, inside of the buildings, and also we we could consider the uh, size of the building around uh, on the on the building's facade when we uh, convert that efficiently to the as a, as for the input of the our, our neural network. Definitely, neural uh, neural network can detect uh, all the SDAs and CDAs built indoors. So maybe the input metrics will, will be varied a little bit, but uh, there's also the capacity we could later call, uh, actually combine those two together. So we should keep in the mind like how we can deal with all the uh, design element of the building associated to the performance um, metric we are going to use. I believe. I think. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I ask you another question? Is that okay? Sure. Oh, all right. So uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, input question following the last question. Uh, those voxels are the, uh, the density of the geometry inside of the 3D space, right? Yes. Uh, so have you considered all the buildings as solid objects, or have you uh, exported all of those voxels as their surfaces, like uh, all those surfaces and their empty voxels inside of them? Oh, uh, 
uh, actual in voxelizer taking surface type geometry and BRAP type geometry and mesh type geometry as an input, but it populated the uh, point, uh, uh, voxelized point on that surface and then nearly or the nearest points of the surface. And then it uh, stores the inf only information of the, of the points information. So all that points can be translated into the array format in the 3D three dimensional array format. And then you could add the value there to train the network in terms of the longitude and latitude, the, the relative coordinate and so on, on that specific point. So the problem is to later, once you redrive the, uh, after you predict this value and then redrive this geometry, you need to recreate your mesh type geometry and interpolate uh, like all this information by your own way, with your own ways. So that's also, that also could be the interesting research area if you wanna, yeah, look in different, different ways. Oh, thank you very much. I wonder if you could follow up to that. Um, is the is the tool aware of the material? So does it know about the reflectance of, of different surfaces? Yes, that all that is also an, uh, yeah another like topic we need to further investigate for this. Like this times so we set the uh, yeah radiance material and then the radius parameter as it is and then material properties as the one simple yeah properties, but we could also expand this like so that's why like some like once we share this methodology and then keep developing our own ANNs and advancing it like at the same time it, there's a huge potential we could like accumulate input like provide accumulated knowledge and effort on this model that was my yeah all right thanks we have a question coming in from YJ uh, YJ Kim do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question uh, hi, um, thank you for the fantastic presentation. And I am a student studying architecture. And so actually I have very fundamental question about your presentation. Um, why, why the mas machine learning technique is required? I mean, is it for reducing the time and cost for the computation? And was it really better than conventional white box model? Um, to be honest, uh, I was also like a background in the architecture as, and then I worked as a designer before I moved into the, yeah, this topic of research. So that times like, well, I found like two major issues. Like I wanted to overcome by myself as a researcher. The first one is the computational time and cost, uh, like, like you just mentioned. And the second one is like some of the designers and design students in the early stage Age of design and their early career, they have limited knowledge on utilizing the, you know, performance simulation software. But there's like many of physics-based guys uh, guided uh, models and software in, uh, ask you to, you know, input like much of the details and information as their assumption, because that that's the how physics-based model works. So in that case, like. Uh, with the with the a better uh, a, a good collaboration with the consultants and then like keep uh, uh the best uh, their knowledge is also important. But at the same time, I would think of like what if I provide more simplified input and output definition for the yeah purpose of the design support in the early stage of design for designers. So so I view that the availability of like uh. The computational decrease in the cost and, and the, in the next generation will be a great asset for the data driven model, as well as also like uh, as a performance specialist and consultant, we, we, we could uh, utilize our full of knowledge and, uh, and accumulated this to develop this type of model and provide to the designers with more simplified and uh, intuitive interface and uh, ideas. I think that would be also valuable and meaningful in, yeah, in my view. Thank you. We have another question coming from Mohammed. Mohammed, go ahead. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if if we add another feature map to our voxel grid, uh, that would be the ambient balance zero of the radiance calculations, like. Uh, we calculate the ambient, uh, ambient balance of zero uh, radiation in all of those voxel points. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that would uh, put, oh, potentially increase the accuracy of our model. 
Uh, first, I wanted to ask you the computational cost of this uh, move. Uh, second, I wanted to ask if it helps with the indoor uh, radiation estimation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, so uh, radiance uh, ambient around zero calculation would be essentially a direct light only calculation. Yeah, exactly. So uh, when we uh, model our uh, sky model, uh, that <clears throat> luminance matrix would, uh, uh, would include many um, radiation uh, vectors inside of it. Uh, with ambient bounds of zero, uh, we can uh, calculate a vector in each of the voxel points of uh, what is the radiation and what is its uh, direction. Um, I think I, I see where you're coming from. I think, you know, as a sort of a lower level question, um, one thing we might ask to Ellie is, are you looking at radiation at specific points in time and putting those together to calculate some of these annual metrics like uh, daylight autonomy? Um, or are you directly training the uh, training your model on annual calculations? Uh, for the ARINET, I use the uh, ambient bounds at the five and the uh, division into 1024. And um, and I set this uh, as, as it is, and then like I input that as a you know constant parameter. But by what why you you can say like if you increase the feature set, then like it, it would be the additional cost. But like I don't think it's really diff yeah different from like the previous uh, training sets. And also for the SDA uh, project, I also use the ambient response as a, a five and a bit division at the same. Yeah, as I remember correctly. And then that times also, I didn't really, uh, you know, add that as an additional feature set. I only uh, mentioned like to, I used the already longitude and latitude and the annual radiation value for that. But but for in uh, created this total SDA uh, for the data generation, I actually generate the data for the radiation and the SDA for each month. And also for the uh, annual accumulation, uh, and your average value. So like we have like multiple feature set as a data set itself. And then like we utilize that information uh, as an input. But yeah, for my uh, research, it was the set of specific uh, ambient bounds and the radiance parameter to simulate the general data, the, uh, generate the general data. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, well, I want to uh, give my thanks to everyone for this. Uh, it's been a very interesting presentation and uh, especially thank you to, to Ellie for delivering this presentation to us. Thank um, thanks everyone for joining us for the IBIPSA USA Research Committee webinar. If you enjoyed this webinar, please consider joining the IBIPSA USA Research Committee. Uh, email research at ibipsa.us or visit the link that I'm placing in the Zoom chat now in order to join our committees. For those of you watching us on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. In December, IBIPSA USA is, host, is hosting two webinars for research authors. Join Shetty Atia for how to write a great building simulation research paper on December 2nd at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And Andy Barris, for A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words, Effective Visualization for Publications on December 16th at noon Pacific time. And please join us again on January 27th at noon Pacific time when Ruth Shulston and Ryan Danks present Comfortable by Design, Developing the City of London Thermal Comfort Guidelines. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.